thank you for joining us and making it over here on a rainy day. Nice to be here. So you have more than $200 billion under your investment purview right now. And, you know, return is definitely one of the things that you have to think about. Uh, I think everyone would here would love to kind of get a general sense of how responsible investing fits into your frame of thinking when you approach that 200 billion, 215 really billion every day. Yeah, well, you're right. I mean, our bottom line is we, we need to meet our, our goal. And uh, we recently lowered our assumed rate of return or, or long term, not what we're going to make every day or month or every year. Uh, we had been at 7% and we lowered it this year to 6.8%. And some might argue that's still an aggressive number, but for uh, public pension funds, the average now is a long-term goal of about 7.25. So we're on, a bit on the more conservative side. Uh, and it's, I think it's important to position the fund to be more conservative in this environment. But when we do that, if we assume we're going to make um, less money, drives up our potential cost. And for us as a public pension fund, you know, we invest the money that our uh, the employees who are part of our system. We have 1.1 million New Yorkers who are in the system. Their contributions, but a bigger part of the money we invest comes from taxpayers. So when there's an issue of, of, of cost, and if we have to raise the contribution rate we charge our government employers, that is an impact on taxpayers. So, so making that bottom line is important to us because obviously we're, we're a public entity, so folks tend to think they can express opinions about you know, what we're doing pretty freely. But at New York Common, New York Common Retirement Fund, which is the investment fund that supports the New York state and local retirement system that pays the benefits, we believe strongly that having a smart and sustainable strategy on investing, and, and you know, you get into the different lingo, right? Sustainable investing, responsible investing, but let's just use it of, of a general category where you, you look at not only where you put your money, but the consequences of those investment opportunities. So. We really have ramped up our corporate engagement. We've ramped up our integration of environmental, social, and governance issues, ESG, and our investment strategy. So I would say that, yes, our fiduciary responsibility is, is to, to meet our number, and return is, is uh, paramount. But um, we feel consistent with meeting our return is having uh, a sensitivity to ESG, to responsible investing, to sustainable investing in a very holistic sense. So it is very much baked into our DNA in terms of how we approach our investment strategy. I think one hot button issue that you faced over the last year or so is the decision not to divest. Uh, how do you respond to some of the criticism of people who believe that you should have been doing more to divest? In terms of, of fossil, fossil fuel fuels, companies. yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. When I, I first became controller um, uh, a lot of years ago, 13 years ago, I didn't come from the investment world. And contrary to what um, most people think, the controller is an elected position in New York, and it tends to be people like me who have spent time in, in, in public life and political office. And uh, so some of the criticism, well, you should have been from Wall Street. And then I got in there, and I thought everybody was going to tell me where I should be investing. And in fact, everybody was telling me where not to invest. I said, wait a minute, is this a divestment job or an investment job? So there are many um, issues that come up and have come up over the years where there's probably been more in terms of public pressure uh, suggesting where we not put our money rather than where we put our money, which seem, always seems strange to me because, you know, we, our goal is to invest and to make money for, for the fund to do it in, in a responsible way. So the issue of the moment, uh, and, you know, some issues come and some issues go, but for today, uh, climate change is a big issue, rightfully so. Uh, the risk of climate change to all of us, you know, to the human family, to the globe is, is, is real. Uh, the risk to us as an investor I think is also real. So the question is, how do you deal with it? And some uh, advocate that the way to deal with it is to not hold any stocks in oil and gas companies, fossil fuel companies. You know, I, my general reaction to that position is that it, if I thought that New York Common divesting our oil and gas stock would solve the climate change issue, I might be inclined to say, well, let's do it. But uh, just selling those stocks, you know, I think is not going to advance uh, an agenda of helping uh, deal with that issue. And it, it, it's too simplistic a strategy, and it also takes away our ability to leverage as a shareholder uh, and as an owner uh, to press uh, even oil and gas companies to try to, to do the right thing uh, in a host of ways on that issue. Uh, but th that being said, you know, the reality is there have been some other categories or sectors where we have divested. So it's not that we are, you know, 
uh, our preference is to be an investor, not a divester, but there, we have some categories, pri private uh, prisons recently, gun manufacturers, uh, companies that would participate in BDS against Israel, tobacco. I mean, you, we, we do have a list of, of areas where we choose not to put money. In those cases, though, where we've done it, take private, uh, private uh, prisons, the, we had limited holdings there anyway, you know, maybe 15 million when we divested, as opposed to fossil fuels where we have billions. So, so one of the challenges is really looking at the impact on the portfolio if we were to take a divestment. One of the things you just mentioned is the ability to work with companies to make any change. Yep. What are the conversations that you do have with these oil and gas companies and how productive is it? Well, it's not as productive as I'd like it to be um, with some of the players, but um, we have used our leverage in concert with other uh, institutional investors that have a similar view that we have. Uh, and our view is a simple one. Uh, climate change is a material risk to the portfolio. The global economy is moving to implement the goals of the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. And I, I was in Paris when that agreement was hammered out. I was on one of the panels, so I saw firsthand how, in spite of what certain people in this country may be saying at the moment, the rest of the world community is going in that direction. Uh, and, and so we believe that our portfolio should be aligned uh, with companies that understand that and are preparing for the transition. So we have pressed on a, a series of issues, uh, certainly in terms of, of uh, disclosure of greenhouse gas emissions, d identification of what your emissions are, uh, and then coming up with a plan to reduce them. That's been one strategy. Uh, to ask companies to uh, suggest how their business plans are going to comport with the goals of, of the Par Paris Agreement, in effect, try to assess their transition readiness. Some companies have been responsive to those requests, and in fact, we haven't had to bring uh, the shareholder resolution to a vote. We've gotten an agreement. Uh, other companies uh, have not been so responsive, and we have a continuing uh, engagement with uh, Exxon as an example of a company that uh, uh, hasn't really responded as, as proactively as we would have liked them to, you know, to do. But, you know, in the context of all this uh, effort, we've, we've taken a very serious look. We, we uh, established, along with the governor, a decarbonization advisory panel that came up with some very specific recommendations on how to incorporate uh, the issue of sustainability uh, as far as climate into our investment strategy moving forward. We have a Climate Action Plan, we could talk in more detail about if you'd like, but I'm very proud to say that the New York uh, Come Retirement Fund probably has had the most ambitious investment strategy to deal with the climate issue of any public pension plan out there. I'm kind of curious as to how this corporate activism works. Um, when it came to Exxon, how did you approach the problem and who else did you turn to as far as their investor base in terms of uh, asking for change? Well. Exxon, I think in some ways we we hit upon a really good strategy as far as a partner. So our co-filer on our uh, resolution with Exxon was the Church of England. So when all else fails, you know, go go to the Lord and see if uh, that can help. And it did. So uh, when we first put the resolution in uh, to argue how their business plan is comporting with. Uh, uh, have them report how it's comporting with Paris, it, I think we got 30 some odd percent in the first go around. And when we did the second filing with great advocacy uh, with our partner, the Church of England, uh, we got 62 percent approval. So it, it, it compelled Exxon to, in fact, come up with a report. Now, the report they came up with was less than we would have wanted. And in the last go around, we, we put forward a, uh, a resolution to um, suggest that they have specific targets and a time frame uh, for reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And unfortunately, uh, that uh, shelter resolution was knocked off by the, by the SEC, you know, which is another dimension to the conversation that's becoming challenging for us as, a, as a, an investor. The SEC, different political winds at the moment, has taken a much more um, conservative point of view as far as shareholder filings. Uh, there are new... Uh, uh, procedures, regulations being proposed now that I think would disadvantage uh, corporate governance activism on the part of, of pension funds and other shareholders that we're very concerned about. Because when we do these uh, corporate engagements, it, it is consistent with our view of what our fiduciary responsibility is and how we are seeking to maximize 
the long-term profitability of our investments. And as a pension fund, we are, we're big, right? We're over 200 billion, so we're everywhere. And we're gonna be around forever. We're not, you know, New York State is not ever going out of business. Uh, so we're, we have a perpetual investment horizon and we're very patient capital as well. So the notion of, of sustainable investing, which is, you know, with a very, very long investment horizon, um, we think gives us the opportunity to be very engaged with corporations to say that the kind of choices you're making, whether it's something on, on you know, your, your corporate governance or on social issues or labor issues or environmental issues, uh, you need to be a good corporate actor, a good corporate citizen in all those areas. So anything that's gonna disadvantage our ability to do that uh, is a concern. So, you know, we have a very broad agenda. We're actually going right now through what our, our next round of filings will be, but we've expanded our staff that works in these issues because we think that's part of being uh, responsible to our 1.1 million members. I do want to get back to that just because the um, barriers to doing that are really interesting. But there's another time you started calling companies. You did start calling JP Morgan and Wells Fargo when um, you were concerned about their relationship to the gun companies. Mm. This is only about a year or two ago, right? Um, at that time, something that drew me to this story was this has been a story for a long time. Why, in the last couple of years, all of a sudden, did everyone rush to the fray? Uh, how, wh when did this become a part of your calculus? It wasn't just in the last couple of years. And what compelled you to finally do something about it? And um, do you believe your voice made a difference there? I mean, I like to think it's made a difference. Um, you know, look, I mean, gun violence is a big issue in our, in our country. And, um, you know, the tipping point for us from an investment perspective uh, you know, with the Sandy Hook shootings in, in Connecticut a couple of years ago, uh, because it, it was at a school, uh, it was it was uh, students, it was young people, it was staff people also. You know, a number of our members in our system work in schools. You know, so the issue of 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 of, of safety to us is kind of a bottom line issue because those those are our members who could be exposed. With. And well, we don't have to get into a, the reality, harsh reality of the number of school shootings that continue to happen in this country. So. So we really felt it was important for us to, to take a position. Uh, you know, and again, this, whenever we do this, there's always a lot of internal debate. I'd be less than candid if I didn't say that. Uh, but again, in terms of our exposure from an investment perspective, we didn't have a lot in, in terms of uh, gun manufacturers, but what we had, we felt we couldn't be there anymore. And we were able to do that after an economic analysis which showed that it, it wouldn't hurt our bottom line. But we felt, uh, because this issue is one that still hasn't been resolved, we needed to look more broadly, and that's where uh, staff came up with the notion that you know perhaps we should engage with the banks and say, if you are part of the financing uh, of gun sales, uh, at, that's, again, from an investor perspective, there's reputational harm and risk if, if some of the guns that you're helping people get are used in these incidents. There's a potential for litigation risk uh, as well. And, and I'd like to think at some point, because of law and regulatory changes that will hopefully happen one day in this country, that also suggests that, that being involved with that particular enterprise or industry is not going to be one from a long-term profitability perspective that makes sense. It's an interesting year also to be calling the banks. You know, uh, they were all drawn to Washington earlier this year. There's a whole host of issues. There's uh, gun control. There's private prisons. Yeah. Uh, there's diversity on their boards. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the difficulty of getting to the politics of the moment. Yeah. <laughs> What's the next thing you're going to be calling J.P. Morgan for? <laughs> well, um, I, I, you know, I think broadly, um, not just in terms of banks, but the newest initiative that we've begun in 2019 and we're going to expand upon going into 2020, because uh, diversity is one of the big issues that we work on, uh, on, a, on a host of measures. but. Uh, one of the newer areas for us, and I'm proud that we've been taking a lead on this, is the issue of disability inclusion. Uh, you look at the numbers and there's a vast talent pool of people with a range of disabilities that are severely underemployed in our society. Uh, so we have been pressing um, corporations, including banks, to make sure that they're updating their, uh, their workplace uh, policies, their hiring policies, uh, to make sure that they're providing opportunities for people with disabilities, that they participate in uh, the opportunity for self-evaluation and benchmarking. There's uh, an organization called Disability In 
has developed something called the Disability Equality Index that gives a company an opportunity to, to look within and then have a roadmap of how to improve their policies. So we, we're advocating very strongly, uh, and certainly with our colleagues in the investment world, that when you check off your list of diversity, you know, gender, race, and uh, sexual orientation, gender identification, and so on, uh, disability inclusion needs to be added to that list. So before I open up uh, to questions, as um, somebody who oversees a more than $2 billion fund, you also allocate to a lot of funds. Um, we have spoken here a lot about how a lot of different private equity firms and whatnot are starting responsible investing funds, um, how, or impact investing funds. How do you look at a firm then, f for argument's sake, that has a responsible investing fund in one pocket, but then is doing things that directly compete with that mm. in other pockets of the firm? Yeah, and it happens. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> and it happens. Or uh, you, you invest with, um, you invest with uh, with, a, with with a, an opportunity, and uh, the, you know they're they're saying the right things, doing the right things, but they're they're paying dues to a trade association that's advocating opposite of of, of you know what they what they what their own workplace policies are, or they are involved with corporate political giving uh, to candidates that are taking a different position than what you know some of their workplace policies are. So th there are often all those contradictions. So what you try to do is is upfront understand what they are. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily preclude our investing in a good fund if one of their sister funds uh, uh, might not be one that we would, we would support or want to be a part of. Uh, but it, it also then compels us, uh, in many cases, to then try to press the investment partner and say, hey, you know, w we have concerns about this, and, and you know, next time you come around with another fund, we, we might not look as favorably. Uh, so, it's not a black and white, you know, if, if, if you're in a fund that's doing some things we don't like, we won't go in there. But again, part of our challenge as a public fund, people are not shy about getting to us if there's a problem. Uh, take la labor, for instance. I mean, you know, the unions are very on top of what's happening in, in their workplaces. It, it, there have been cases where, you know, there's, well, most recently, you know, United Auto Workers were on strike. And, um, and we wrote a letter uh, to General Motors saying, Good labor relations are important. The strike is going to cost money. You know, what are you doing to ensure that negotiations are, are staying on uh, on track? So, we weren't looking to not be invested in General Motors anymore. But um, you know, very often um, it will be some public entity. In this case, it was a union that'll come to us and say, "Hey, we see you're invested in, in, in X fund uh, or with X manager," and and then we'll look and we'll say, "This happens happens rather frequently." Oh yeah, we're with them, but we're not in that particular fund that you have that concern. Well, but still, but you're with them, so you got You must have leverage with them, you know. So, and we do try to be responsive if, if we think a reasonable objection is being raised. Doesn't always mean they listen to us, but we we do try to press them. I don't steal all your time. Let's see if the audience has any questions. Yes. First question: Does the fund invest in direct real estate, and if so, how do you consider the greenhouse gas emissions of that real estate? We don't do very much directing, uh, direct investment in real estate anymore. That kind of is what we used to do uh, years ago. Um, the, the one exception, I'm very proud to say not far from here, is 390 Madison Avenue. It was a repurposed building that we uh, just recently completed. And, and we certainly in, in, included state of the art in terms of environmental and, and uh, a green building. I don't remember which level of certification it ended up with. but. Um, when we when we do our investment real estate funds, though, we always ask the question of what is what is your ESG policy and how are you comporting with the direction that everybody seems to be going in. Again, we ask for that disclosure to help guide our investment decision. It doesn't mean that we will only go with investments that are meeting the highest standards. We'd we'd like to press uh, our investment partners to do that, but it, it is a factor. Not the only factor that's considered, but the first question is, what is your your ESG policy? And and frankly, if, if it's a very poor policy or it's a non-existent policy, you know that that could determine that we wouldn't go in an investment. It's interesting with um, not just with real estate, but with with, with private equity uh, particularly as well. There have been cases where uh, we've gotten a pitch for for an investment and an opportunity that may look good for us, and we've had cases where. A company has not had, uh, uh, or, or a fund hasn't had an ESG policy. An investment manager hasn't had one at all. 
And very often, before we would give approval, suddenly they come up with one. So, you know, we do try to ask the right questions up front. Again, it doesn't necessarily mean that that will be a, uh, a deal breaker for us, but that is part of what we look at, not just with real estate, but with all the alternatives. Does the fund engage in foreign direct investments? In? Foreign direct investments? We, um, we have some co-investment opportunities with some of our uh, investment partners, but, you know, we... You know, m much of our fund is, is in public equities, where, and much of that is through index funds that are internally managed. For uh, m uh, our international and global equities that we do with investment partners, so the active management uh, is largely what's done with the international and global, uh, not done in-house. And um, with the alternatives, uh, real estate, private equity, real assets, we have a teeny bit of hedge funds and, and a diminishing amount. None of that is done direct, so that's all through funds and other managers. Do you think that the market signals from divestment are more effective than shareholder activism, especially in terms of climate action? S say the first part again. Do you think that the market signals from divestment are more effective than shareholder activism, particularly as it relates to climate action, more or less? Um, you know, it's... It's it's such a it's such a tough question on, on divestment because I think. You know I think the challenge first when you talk about climate is you know the reality is the focus tends to be on on the oil and gas companies and fossil fuels but but any organization, uh, any play, even as the earlier question about, um, emissions from from a building that we might directly own, there's a carbon footprint that any organization has. And, and one of my concerns with, with those that just talk about fossil fuels is that, you know, well, what about transportation? And what about agriculture? What about utilities? And, you know, you're leaving a lot of the other pieces out that are an important part of the, of the equation. And I, and I do think that, that, that some of the companies that might be viewed as, you know, um, uh, operating in the dirty sectors of our economy, in fact, are also the ones that are recognizing that there needs to be a transition. They're doing some creative things. They certainly have the resources and the talent, you know, to come up with solutions. So, you know, I, I think by and large, from an American perspective, um, the market is, is not really signaling uh, divestment as, you know, as a strategy. You could probably argue that the European market is, is more likely to, if not divest, certainly put money more in, in, in clean energy and the new technologies than the American marketplace is. But, you know, from my perspective, uh, if, if big funds from the public side, like New York, you know, like California, if we say that we have a real concern about the climate issue, and if you are in energy generation, oil and gas, how are you dealing with that? And if we're also saying we are open for business, you know, part of what we have done as part of our climate action plan is We've doubled the amount of money we now have allocated to what we call our sustainable investment portfolio. So now we have 20 billion where we are seeking to look for opportunities, particularly with solar, with wind, with, with clean technology, with clean energy. So I'm, we're hoping that sends a market signal. Uh, uh, you know, but it's a challenge for us because we are so big. You know, we, we get investment opportunities that come to us, but they, if they're not big enough for, for a scale, uh, of our, you know, that we can scale up. It, it really becomes a challenge for us in terms of putting our money w with the opportunities the way that we'd like them to be, so. I'm not thinking about this much at all. <laughs> all the Think time. Lot, yeah. Anyways, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um,